Welcome to Frame of Reference, informed, intelligent conversations about the issues and challenges facing everyone in today's world. In-depth interviews with Sauk County's leaders and professionals to help you expand and inform your Frame of Reference. Brought to you by the Max FM Digital Network. Now here's your host, Raul Labresh. Well, welcome to another edition of Frame of Reference, Saw County and Beyond, and I am continuing my And Beyond series of, of uh, interviews with folks across the country, and it's been really exciting because we've been talking with experts in all kinds of areas um, throughout the United States, uh, and in one case, somebody in Europe, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, and my guest today is uh, someone I've just, I, I'm really admired, even though I know virtually nothing beyond his bio. Um, but, you know, it's just to start out with, my guest today, Christopher Maher, is a former Navy SEAL. Okay, so if, if you can't hear those words, former Na- Navy SEAL, and number one, thank, well, thank you for your service, Chris, number one, and sincerely, not just a, you know, platitude, well, but thank, thank you for you. saying that. But uh, beyond that, being a Navy SEAL, that ain't exactly something for a wimpity wimp. Um, you know, you, the, the little <laughs> bit that I know about SEALs and the kinds of training, what do they call it with a, when you're first starting out? Is it a pup? What, what, there's a, a, a kind of a plea. Uh, buds. Buds. Okay, buds. SEAL bud. Buds. So, which yeah. is, uh, you know, you, and the, the things I've you know, watched documentaries and whatnot, it's like, holy cow, these guys are just brutalized for months. And uh, the, I, if I were in that situation, the only thing I can think that I would think of is a bunch of other guys have made this. I'm going to make it, too. So in the midst of all of the my body is shrieking at me going, I didn't even know I had things that could hurt in that place. But beyond that, you just say, no, I'm doing this for a, a greater cause and I'm doing this for uh, you know, myself to some extent, but I'm also not going to let these guys down that I'm, I'm working with. And I know I can do it. I know I can. I know I can. So you endured intense physical, mental, emotional stress through that. But you came to it from a place, too, that um, you'd had childhood experience with that. So it wasn't like that was a new thing to you, from what I can tell. But uh, And now Chris, is uh, he's studying traditional Chinese medical practices at the Pacific College of Oriental Medicine and at Yosan University. And he's also uh, has continued his studies at the Universal Healing Tao System, a student of the Grand Master Mantak Chia, and the Universal Tao Master School of Ching, Chiang Mai? Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai in Thailand. He's currently pursuing a master's and doctorate degree in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So, Chris, thank you. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you for talking with me today. Um, I'm happy to be here. I can see you're a very excitable person <laughs> once you get going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been yeah. accused of that on a couple of occasions. <laughs> so it comes from my theater background. You know, we don't do anything yeah. small, so it's yeah. go big or go home in the theater world. So yeah, but uh, yeah. Chris, I, I mean, I, it works for you. Uh, it yeah, works for you. You know, I, I try yeah, to. Yeah, you're very sincere. animated. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, too bad they can't see that, you know, in a podcast form. One of these days I'll go video and then people will see just what a nut job I am. And that's fine with me. I don't, don't have anything to hide. So, but uh, Chris, I, I, I do uh, sincerely, sincerely appreciate um, you have come from a, a background of, from what I can tell, I'm reading between the lines, but uh, a, a kid that comes out of situations that you must have been in, things that would have uh, caused intense physical, mental, emotional stress. Yeah. Um, a lot of kids don't recover from that. A lot no, of they don't. Never. Most don't. Yeah. Yeah, most don't. I mean, it's just, uh, it's hard in those places to see a way out, right? It's hard to see a way yeah. to recovery. Yeah. Like go down to the local prison, Right. Right. And uh, or go down to the local homeless shelter or um, go down to the local, you know, foster home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to find a lot of kids that aren't going to make it right. They're going to find a lot of adults that didn't make it. And what I mean by that is they never had an opportunity, a real opportunity to have enough space away from all the difficult things that they were dealing with, or they were also missing people who were supportive and loving and spacious 
which gave me enough time and space to be able to start to rewrite my own history. And without those people, without those circumstances, without those institutions, um, I could be homeless right now. I could be dead. I could be in prison. And um, to be fair, it's something that I thought about when I was younger, which gave me a lot of appreciation for all the people who helped me along the way. Mm -hmm. And yet as I've gotten older, um, I've appreciated all the difficult things that I've gone through. So instead of appreciating the people who helped me get to the other side, now I appreciate the pain. I yeah. appreciate the discomfort. I, I uh, appreciate the challenges because those are the things that have made me what I consider to be a very valuable asset in society uh, for anyone and anyone who wants to grow beyond their limitations, who's been through any level of stress, childhood stress or work stress or emotional stress that wants to experience what it is they really came for. They want to know who it is they really are. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, we were talking just a little bit before we started recording, and I said I'm kind of a Star Trek nut. And uh, one of the movies that gets, uh, I think, un, unfairly maligned is uh, Star Trek V. And uh, in that movie, there's a wonderful line that the, the – uh, the main antagonist, protagonist, Cybok, who's supposedly, you know, Spock's half-brother. Um, there's all this, ooh, Spock had a half-brother stuff going on. But then on top of it, he the thing that he's doing to get people to follow him is taking their pain. He takes their pain mm-hmm. from them. And and people that, you know, they they love the fact that my pain is gone now. I I, I feel like I'm, I'm restored and blah, blah, blah. He goes and tries to do that with Kirk. And Kirk stops him dead in his tracks and says, no. I need my pain. My pain is what helps drive me. It's it's something to that effect. But I remember being just so kind of enraptured with that because I I believe that myself. I've I've got pain in my life, Uh, some things that uh, were devastating at the time, you know, as a little kid and as a teen. Um, And, uh, you know, when I think about the impact that's had on me and throughout my life, it would be really easy to say, you know, oh, oh poor me, or, you know, I'm going to make sure I screw people uh, so I don't get screwed ever again, or whatever. Um, and I, I totally agree with you talking about having that support system. When you think about the number of people that do not have a support system, they don't yeah. have anybody there. A grandma, even, you know, in a lot of, a lot of previous yeah. times, there was a, a next generation or a, a further back yeah. generation that had the wisdom and the understanding and the time and the emotional compassion, empathy to be able to say that kid just needs some loving, you know, that, that kid needs yeah. somebody to, you know, care about them. And I found that to be true throughout my life. These kids that are just in theater, you know, we have a bunch of just kids that don't fit in anywhere. And they come into the theater and it's, you know, come as you are and uh, you're quirky and you might have some behavioral issues, but, you know, in theater, you get to work it out. It's uh, it's a safe place for that. So, yeah, and that's really the key. I mean, really, it's providing a safe space for young people so that they can explore the depth of who they are yep. and come to a place of realizing that their uniqueness has as much value as the normality that everybody else experiences, you know, and being normal atypical for me, um, you know, I think about things in a different way. I operate in a different way than an old person does. And and so that was of a benefit to me because it gave me intense focus. Um, Yet you said something earlier that I want to speak to about uh, Captain Kirk and There's a place, and I resonated with that initially, where you want to keep your pain because your pain is is your driver. And pain can help us grow through negative benefit. Mm -hmm. The challenge with negative benefit is that it requires struggle and strife. And, you know, now I've laid out a path where people can do what you say that the the protagonist or antagonist character did. And Star Trek five is I help ease people from their pain. And as you transmute that pain, a person gets to shift out of growing through positive benefit and ease and grace 
as opposed to struggle and strife. Yet when struggle and strife is all you know, then you want to hold on to that because that's part of your identity. Yeah. And so basically what Captain Kirk was saying is that my identity is around my pain. My identity is around my rebellion. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and so when you have so much of that, it becomes very difficult to lay that sword down because you don't know anything else. And so it would be very intimidating for anyone where their pain has been their driver to accept that, hold on, you mean I can get further, faster, experience more and have more joy, more fun, more pain and more happiness. And all I have to do is lay down my pain. (laughs) You know, that's a very difficult assumption for humans to make because for tens of thousands of years, humans have been brutalized and have lived in survival based strategies. And what I mean by that is they've been in fight, flight, freeze, or fallen. And those states are what you call survival-based states. Then you have what are called thriving-based states. In order to get out of a survival-based state, you have to have what's called a successful pattern interrupt. And you have to build enough internal resistance so that the external stress always available on planet earth wherever you turn left right up down behind you in front of you it's always there to be engaged with Mm -hmm. yet when you have enough internal resistance what happens is you make different choices and those choices allow you to do what right they allow you to get to the crossroad of life and instead of always turning left suddenly you have an opportunity to turn right. right. And, and it's intimidating to turn right because you've never been down the road to the right. When you're in a survival-based strategy and your identity is over-identified with pain, left looks like heaven, right? Right, which is ease and grace, and releasing your pain and your trauma and your stress and your emotional and psychological distortion looks like hell. Yeah. Because whenever you get love, and, and and I know you'll remember this in your relationship with your wife if you go back far enough, there was a point where you guys were like, this is, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing in the world. And then all of a sudden you work out one day and you're like, this is terrible. <laughs> and it, <laughs> how how do I get out of this relationship? My wife did that just right? yesterday. Yeah, I think so. So Yeah. yeah. And right? like every, so, every day before that for the past 35 years. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, so, and, yeah. And, and, right. And so when you look at that, you have to understand that when you receive love, love brings up everything that's not love. And so everything that's not love Amen. has to have an opportunity to be re-experienced. But then who, who do we project it onto, right? right? We project it onto our kids. We project it onto our bosses. We project, we project it onto our lovers. We project it onto our partners. We project it onto, we project it onto our spouses. We project it onto our coaches. So whenever you get love, like spacious love, that's so warm, that's so inviting, again, it brings up everything that's not love. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's very intimidating to let go of generational pain, generational distortion, generational illusion, because we have a society that's built on this idea that, well, if it isn't hard, it isn't worth working for, right? You know, when I was in the SEAL teams and SEAL training, I remember thinking, on a semi-regular basis that anything that's worth having is worth working hard for. And the truth is, is it isn't. A bear, right, a bear comes out of hibernation, right, walks down to the river, sits at the edge, waits for a fish to swim up, catches it, eats it, and then goes back and lays down. <laughs> right? Oh, took care a of that. frog sits on its lily pad. Waits for a fly to go by, right? Sends out its long tongue, snatches the fly, pulls it in, and continues to sit on its lily pad, relaxing for the rest of the day. And when we look at nature, right, you have to go, oh, it's really meant to be simple. It's really meant to be easy. Yet when you look at thousands of years of survival-based strategies, 
those strategies that are plugged into our genetics and our epigenetics, which are influencing the way we're thinking, the way we're feeling, the way we're sensing, the way we're emoting, the way we're perceiving. Guess what happened? we start to access these ways of dysfunctional behaviors because it's all that we know. And then every bit of our conscious mind, which is our brain, which is designed to keep us safe, is telling us, no, it needs to be difficult. No, it needs to be difficult. While our soul, right, in retrospect uh, and in the moment and in the future tense is telling us constantly, no, it's supposed to be easy. If it's not easy, then maybe it's incorrect. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How hard is it for the moon to travel around the earth? How difficult is it for the earth to move around the sun? How difficult is it for trees to transition from summer into fall, into winter, everything that's around us, right, within nature and outside of us in terms of the solar system is very easy. And yet we continue to project that life is supposed to be difficult. And when you run up against a moment where you're severely triggered, that's your opportunity to create a pattern interrupt. And what I mean by that is this. When you sit back, You're totally triggered. You're getting ready to project onto this other person and blame. They're the problem. The government's the problem. Gun control is the issue. The Second Amendment is the problem. Uh, The banking system is the problem. The educational system is the problem. You lose your opportunity to go, hold on. Why am I vested in that belief? Because when I'm upset, what I'm saying is, is, I'm competing with how the universe naturally operates. If you want to use that upset as a catalyst and an opportunity to make yourself a better person, meaning to learn to listen more clearly, to learn to take heartfelt action to your own benefit and those who you influence equally, to learn to be more selfless for other people, to learn to be more selfish. If you're willing to do that, and you're willing to question your upset and go, oh, I'm the one that's responsible for myself being triggered in this moment. You now have an opportunity to create a new destiny, right? Your, your people who trigger you in your life are your greatest assets, right? The systems in your life to trigger you are your greatest assets because then you get to choose, do I want to participate? And if I'm upset, I'm, ch- I'm at choice to participate. Now, when I take that half step back and I'm sitting here and I'm analyzing and I take a deep breath and I let go of this vested interest that I have in this thing needing to look this way, be this way and sound this way for me to be OK, I'm now empowered to create the life that I really want. Yet if I'm unwilling to question why I'm triggered and if I'm unwilling to own that my own upset, I will only continue to be at the effect of survival based strategies. Well, there's a lot to talk about there, isn't there? So <laughs> Chris, let's back up a little bit because I, I mean, I, I'm swimming with a probably – at least 15 questions I want to ask or, or think places I can see the discussion going, but, uh, I'm a format guy and it's fair to my other guests to make you go through the same grueling stress that, that, you know, we all go through. And, uh, it's a little, uh, just a little get to know you exercise called my favorite things. And so very Rorschachian, very, I don't think you'll struggle with this at all. Cause I, I you're not going to stress over these kinds of questions, but I'm just going to ask you what's your favorite bird or whatever. And you, you just come up with whatever you want, describe it more fully if you want, but, uh, it's just, it's meant to be just an opportunity for us to get to know you. Anyone that's listening go, Oh yeah, I like the color blue too. So whatever. Okay. So here we go. Ready? So I'm going to answer the first question. Yeah. My favorite bird is the Philadelphia Eagles. The Philadelphia <laughs> Eagle. 
<laughs> not just any eagle, a Philadelphia. Not just eagle. any eagle, a okay. green eagle. <laughs> okay, and your and your favorite, uh, probably your favorite concept is a Philadelphia freedom, right? Maybe I don't know. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Well, my so, book is called Free is called Free for Life. Okay. There you go. See. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you already said your favorite color too. It's uh, uh, Philadelphia green, right? So yes, it is. Uh, favorite yeah. sandwich. Philadelphia eagle green. Yeah. yeah. My favorite sandwich is a Philadelphia cheesesteak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about your favorite piece of furniture? Let's see. My favorite piece of the furniture is. Um, you know when when they uh, they take these huge redwoods and they cut them into a table, mm-hmm. a tabletop, mm-hmm. and it has all those natural lines. That's my favorite kind of furniture, all natural wood. Okay, so so you can see all that grain. You can see what that that tree has been through. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Uh, in our area, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a, several Amish communities. They're not as big as like the ones in Pennsylvania or Indiana, but. Um, they're the woodwork that they do is always very oh. you know, aware of the grain, aware of having the wood work with, you know, all of the different parts, putting them together. So I, I, I think you would love to go to some of the Amish shops. If you ever get to Wisconsin, we can show you some of the back roads, Amish communities and see what you find. Yeah, so, I grew up in Lancaster County, oh, which is okay, the sure. largest Amish community in Pennsylvania. Sure, sure. That's so the, the horse and buggy. I've come around the corner yeah. in my Camaro, yeah. right? Yeah. 1986, yeah. doing like 70. <laughs> and like there is an Amish cart, yep. horse and buggy in front yep. of me. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. okay. And, uh, and <laughs> I love that there's this slow moving vehicle triangle on the back of them too. It's always like, yes. okay. Yeah. So, all right. You know, and then they're usually always trying to wave us past. I'm like, I, I can't go past you. This is a non-passing yes. zone. So, yeah. but, uh, okay. How about a favorite? Do you uh, have a favorite animal? My favorite animal is the eagle. You Philadelphia <laughs> eagle again, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, we live in Wisconsin. I'm, I live like four blocks from the Wisconsin River, and this is a place where bald eagles inhabit in the winter time. So I. Oh, wonderful. I, I'm sorry, but Wisconsin eagles, I, I put them against the Philadelphia eagle anytime. I just you know, not trying to start a fight because <laughs> yeah, there's not yeah. very many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's well, they do the well. Philadelphia though. Eagles fans. Yeah. I would put the Philadelphia Eagles fans okay. up against the Wisconsin Badger Bald fan. Eagle. Yeah, a Green Bay <laughs> Packer fan. You know, I I, I always kind of get my, my ire gets up. I'm not a huge football fan or anything by any means, yeah. but uh, my ire gets up a little bit when they talk about, you know, Dallas Cowboys, America's team. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, the Green Bay Packers are the only one that are still owned by the people, okay? It's not Comcast. It's not, you know, Spectrum yeah. Charter. I mean, yeah. it's, it's right. still we, owned by the people yeah. and – in addition to that, have won the most NFL championships and have won the most NFL games. They are by far, they're so far ahead of every other team. It's you, you, <laughs> the Cowboys are, they're, yeah, they're misplaced. <laughs> well, they Our just ego have, is misplaced. They, they just have, they have oil money. What can we say? So, yeah. but, uh, okay. How about your favorite piece of music? My favorite piece of music is the music that I write. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. What kind of music do you so, write? I write, uh, you know, Americana Soul. Okay. So I'll dip into a little country, a little folk, a little R&B, a little gospel. Oh, like cool. I'm willing to to do it all. Cool. Do you play guitar, piano? What's your? I play guitar. I play piano. Okay. I play, you know, acoustic, electric. Uh, I started out as a drummer and then shifted into something more dynamic. Cool. In terms of the melody, uh, okay. so piano was second, and my third instrument was acoustic guitar. And then I shifted into the electric the last few years, and uh, I love it. I love it. I'm all self-taught with everything, and it's a fun way to, for me to explore emotion. Sure. And feelings sure. that are outside of my normal frame of reference and how I operate. And it's an opportunity to let go and um, connect with source and create. I mean, we are, look, we're humans. We're the thing that makes us so powerful on this planet is we're co creators constantly. Yeah. Yeah. In the image of the creator. So, 
Yeah. I, well, and you have a great name for that too, with the last name Maher. There's a tradition of Mahers, you know, in the musical community that uh, that goes way back. So with all kinds yeah. of genres, right? So how about do you have a favorite book or favorite quote? Maybe? My favorite book is Mutant Message Down Under by a woman named Marla Morgan. I have to write that down. And am I? Mutant yeah, it's message. a fabulous. It's a yeah, mutant message down under. Which is funny that we're talking about this because on Thursday night I will be flying to Australia. Wow! And I've never been there before. Cool, cool. And uh, so that's that's exciting. And then my other favorite book is "Way of the Spiritual Warrior" by Dan Millman. You know, these are the books that sort of got me started. And in my last book, it's the Celestine Prophecy. Which those are all really wonderful stories, which I think are great. But if someone was going to read a book, I would suggest them to read Free for Life, a U.S. Navy SEAL's unique path to inner freedom and outer peace. Because that, I feel, is in – it's a great story, but there's deep philosophy, but it's also instructional in the sense that you get a deep ed- education and around something that you said you wanted to talk about, which was uh, stress management versus stress resolution. Okay. And we get to start to tap into that education because the truth is, is that without education and information and knowledge, how can you make a good informed decision about what to do with your time, your energy and your resources as it pertains to your health? And your mental wellness, right. right? Your emotional wellness and your energetic wellness and your physiological wellness and your structural wellness. How can you make a good decision if you have no idea about stress resolution versus stress management? Right. Well, I think about education as being bounce this idea. Something I've thought about a number of times is that education gives us language too. And oftentimes, especially with with men, I think part of our our difficulty with emotionality and dealing with our emotions is we we don't learn enough vocabulary to describe the range of emotions that humans feel. So, you know, you'll ask, uh, you know, a man, what are you feeling right now? I feel kind of angry. You know, well, I, you know, what are you angry about? I don't know, I'm just angry. Well, diffuse anger. What what happened? Was was there some event or whatnot? Well, it's, this guy got in front of me and he was just really, really rude. And so, so are you feeling a sense of injustice? Is there, you know, so you, and we just don't spend the time thinking through the levels of complexity that there are in emotion. And we don't realize that there's, you know, a bazillion words to describe emotional states. And when you're limited in how you can describe things, you really don't know what to say except, well, that's red. Well, no, that, that's really blue. Blue? What the heck is blue? I've never heard of blue. So, well, that's blue. Well, I thought it was red. Well, I, I get it. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, there's less... Um, there's less subtle distinctions, yeah. right? And the wonderful thing about distinction is this. The more subtle distinction, the more subtle the distinction is, the more intelligent you become. Yeah. yeah. And because yeah. the lack of language, it reduces men's opportunity to become emotionally intelligent. And I leave a little bit of that or a lot of that up to mothers yeah. because the the – the challenge I have currently with society is that men are willing to teach their daughters about how the external world works. Mothers never take the time to teach their sons. And I mean, never take the time to teach their sons how the emotional world works. And so because that's outside of our frame of reference, it's unfair and inequitable. And so women quite often marry men who are emotionally handicapped and they're handicapped only because they lack the ability to communicate effectively what they're really feeling. Mm -hmm. And because they can't communicate it, they lean on stoicism as an opportunity to feel safe because if you have the language and you have the wherewithal and the understanding you're then able to communicate clearly to your own benefit. But if a man cannot communicate clearly to his own benefit, whenever he's in a relationship, whenever he's in a marriage, mostly his needs will never be met at an emotional level. And so then we lean heavily on sexual intercourse 
because the intercourse at least it allows us to feel. Yeah, and it allows right. a, a it, connection of some sort. Right? Yeah, so. it allows a connection of some sort. And so, and I get and understand why women are frustrated, but women are going to continue to be frustrated as long as they hold the emotional realm to themselves. And I get it. They should have. Like if if the only realm that women had was the emotional realm because men occupied the physical realm, we occupied the spiritual realm, and we occupied the analytical realm. When's the last time you saw a um, the Pulitzer Prize winner or a uh, um, a Nobel Peace Prize? How many Nobel Peace Prizes have been handed out to women? Yeah. Right. How many priests or how many pastors are female? How many women are paid hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to be physical? Right. Okay. Right. And so I get it. So the emotional world has been their world where they've been able to sort of dominate and manipulate from. Yet ultimately will never be, the races will never be equal unless women are willing to give their little boys, their sons, that opportunity to meet their wives at an emotional level. Yeah. Because if a son could meet a wife at an emotional level and a mother at an emotional level, there would be no competitions between wives and mothers. <laughs> they wouldn't feel the need to do so because their emotional needs would actually be getting met because their sons understand how to communicate their desires, wants, and their needs. Yeah. Well, and men would and they're be able no to longer understand. threatened. Men, men would yeah, be able to understand why we feel threatened by a woman taking a role that's traditionally a male role, right? Yeah. So right. And understand, well, where is that coming from? Why do I feel that way? Why Why does that matter, what your gender is, for occupying a, a, a particular vocation? It just doesn't make any yeah. sense. But yeah. Okay, last question, last favorite thing, because we keep going off onto things that are probably more important to talk about, but uh, well, I, <laughs> I know they're more important to talk about. But uh, this is a question that I ask people to think back. Is there a, an experience or a memory that you have? Um, and it might not be that far ago, but I, I think of my childhood. There are particular memories that when something in my life reminds me of that thing or that, that place or that person, it always brings me to a, a more centered place. It brings me to a, a more... Uh, contented place and a, a fondness and a, it just, I, I guess ultimately it puts me in a more positive mindset because I can think back of that and go, that was a, that was a good, good moment. That was a good, uh, that person was a good influence in my life or however that might work for you. I think the challenge for me with this question is that my whole life I've pretty operated. I've operated like that, meaning you know, we started this conversation off with um, we discussing about the childhood stress and trauma that I've been through and how I'm lucky that I didn't get into, um, into you know, the jail system, right, into the prison system. I'm fortunate enough that I get, didn't get into the homelessness or um, intense amounts of violence or alcoholism or drug addiction or any one of these rehab centers. I'm fortunate. The thing that kept me out of, of all of that is the thing that you're talking about, because all along the way, I've been able to extrapolate positive associations with the things that I was going through in those times. Okay. Right. And that was my winning strategy. You know, that's how I avoided punishment, rejection, humiliation, violence and discomfort, because I was always it was easy for me to turn the negative into a positive in terms of my mindset, even though at an emotional level, I might have been suffering. My mind was doing its best to see things through a positive periscope. So how did you do that? Did you was there a, a, a person in your life that was already doing that, that you could model after, or was it just a no, genetic it skill? It was inherent. Okay. It was inherent. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's how I came out. Okay. It's like, you know, you have a kid that's four years old and they can play and they're blind and they can play the piano, the most complex classical piano pieces. And they're four years old and they're blind. Right. 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 I came out that way. Okay. 
So you're an idiot savant out. of just cool things. Yes. So, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I was an idiot savant of the, and I am neuroatypical. So, um, that helped me to a point, right? Because, um, it's easy to look at the world through, um, shiny sunglasses that make everything wonderful yet ultimately your body is still taking in the the negative imprint of the environment around you right right and i got to a place where that strategy no longer worked well and there are people that will see that in another person and I, my experience has been there are folks that are almost antagonized by someone that can do that and will yeah. lash out against it as if they're there to prove to you that life is not a big rosy, you know, barrel of funness or positivity. And, you know, you just ain't have it as rough as I've had it. So let me teach you a lesson. Right. Um, I I can think of that, you know, in my life, I was always blessed to have people around me that um, I could develop allegiances with pretty regularly, pretty easily by sense of humor or um, I, I was fairly empathetic. I was emotionally sensitive as a kid. And, you know, some people like, thought I was gay and were antagonistic towards me because I was too emotional for a guy. You know, come on. Uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, that just wasn't – you didn't do that unless you were effeminate. And I don't know yeah. why. It's the way I came out. Um, but yeah. there were people that were, you know, openly hated me or acted in a very aggressive uh, stance because of that. And then thankfully there were people in my life that said, you want to get it raw? You're going through me. And you know, they were the size of a brick house. So didn't have to worry too much about physical abuse, but so I get what you're saying. Yeah. I think, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I can relate to what you're saying in a sense that I've always had protectors around me. Mm-hmm. And if someone was ever, um, inappropriate, I felt like they received their karma very quickly. Hmm. Uh, my mom was very, um, I grew up, was born in the sixties and, um, on the same day that, you know, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. Really? Yeah. So it was, it was a heavy energy to come into, right. you know what I mean? He was assassinated and then I land onto the planet hours, hours later and it's in Philadelphia, which was predominantly known as a black city. And, you know, Robert F. Kennedy was, he was the hope of the African-American in the 60s because of his policies that he wanted to push. And what he felt was unfair and inequitable, and he was going to stand for those things. Right. And so I came into a very depressed America, mm-hmm. right, for at least – a particular portion of the population. Right. Well, King had been killed too shortly before that. Yeah. That right. you know, so you've got this sort of multi-layered domino effect. Yeah. You know, his brother had been killed 5 years before that. I mean, we had a whole, you know, look at that that song, you know, anybody hear what happened to Abraham, Martin and John, you know, and you just yeah. it's like uh, somebody comes with a, a beacon of light and they just get mowed over. So, I I, I hear you. It's a yeah. Yeah, right, it's a heavy time to be born. It's so. a heavy time to be born. And so when you come in, I think it was very easy for me that they can go inside and choose to be very deep. Yeah. And in college, you know, that was my nickname. Deep deep. <laughs> and so I've always been able to like, <laughs> like drill it. down into something that's very negative and get down to that place of going, Oh, I understand why that is that way. And if I can understand something, I can always accept something. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, um, idiot savant nature of my mind's ability to be able to do that has always kept me looking at all the things that I've been through and finding the thread, the silver lining to understand that it has purpose. Yeah. It has purpose beyond what, what I know right now. And so I have this inherent trust with God. I have this inherent trust with, you know, Supreme prime creation. And it's led me to be able to look upon most of my life and go, okay, yeah, I'm happy I went through those experiences because I love who I am. Yeah. Yeah. 
isn't that core too to a lot of dysfunctionality is uh, people not recognizing that hating that never getting past that you know remaining in a point of uh, antagonism towards negative events in your life fractionize fraction what is the word um you know it it uh, it breaks us it you know makes it difficult to um have a life that's united when you're fighting some fragment and saying, no, I don't want that to fit in anymore. Well, it does fit. It's part of, of what happened to you and brought you to who you are today. I, I, you know, I have negative experiences too that I look back and think, no, that, that taught me a level of empathy and compassion. That taught me, as theater did, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying in theater that no one thinks of themselves as an antagonist. So the key to playing very negative people in the theater is to try to unravel, well, what, what is it that happened that That's taught right. that person that that yeah. was an operable life choice, that that was, yeah. that was a way to succeed or that was a way to attain what they wanted in life, to survive, right? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's the same with any of us, I think, ultimately, that we have to have that sense of this happened. It wasn't a wonderful experience at the time, but I understand it now and I'm embracing it now because it's part of a bigger whole that I like. I like me. I like, I like what my life has become as a result, partially of that, but then of what I did with that going down the road. So, and you can teach that to other people, right? The beauty of it is you have horrible experiences happen, it makes it harder for you to judge someone for one and easier facilitates the idea of, well, you know, when I went through that, this is what I found. Maybe this will be helpful to you. Um, but if nothing else, yeah. I know it's difficult, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think to sum it up, um, to distill it down, what we're saying is, is that the negative and the positive both have the opportunity to lead to the same place. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's letting go and realizing that, look, you're part of a bigger whole, Right. Like, and it's fun to play with the idea of free will, right? But free will also lives within systems. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. no one's will is above the system. And realizing that everything that you've called into your life is there for you as an opportunity to love, regardless of what it is. Because in the beginning, all there ever was, was love. And then we, God decided to add light, and light carried information and knowledge. And then when you add love to light, you get an extremely enormous big bang, which then creates material. And so in the beginning, all there ever was was love. In the end, love is all that ever matters. Yeah. And love so if we get to that matter. place, so yes, love is the source of all matter with the added value of light, right? Because it's the information that allows love to create form, right? It's the structure, it's the numbers, it's the science behind it. And, um, you know, we have this beautiful opportunity now in society to be able to check ourselves, to, to take stock in new things and new ideas, because there's all this free information that's available that was unavailable. Like my mom committed suicide when she was 29. She was obviously mentally ill, right? Her mental wellness was never being attended to. She was never being supported in that place. She went through very detrimental, intense experiences that shattered her and fractured her emotionally. Her father, my grandfather, died of cirrhosis of the liver. What do we know? Mental illness, right? right. So if you got a grandfather who slowly killed himself, Right. Over time, you have a mother who through blunt force trauma killed herself. You look back at that history and you go, oh, OK, I get it. There's a lot of mental illness that's been going on around us. And we've been doing everything we can to manage these varying stress states unsuccessfully. And what I mean by that is 
alcohol is an unsuccessful stress management tool because in the end it destroys your health. Right. Mm -hmm. And when your health is compromised, so is your consciousness. Right. Let me say that again. When your health is compromised, so is your consciousness. And so when we look at these stress management tools that we've been using to survive our circumstances, we realize that we end up where you and I started in our conversation. Everyone who's our age should remember where they were when they heard about the first person walking into a McDonald's with a submachine gun and killing either 14 or 24 people. I don't remember the exact number. It was a lot. And now, right, in the United States, having 167 mass shootings, Right. We started with one. That's where the the cultural stress level was in terms of our success of managing our stress. When we look at one hundred and sixty seven in a year. So now we're one hundred and sixty seven times less successful at managing our stress. That's a big number. Like if you really look at it through through that um, through that window. You start to go, oh, my goodness, what's the best thing that I can do for society? Is it to sign petitions to change gun laws? Is it to get rid of the Second Amendment? Is it is it, you know, is it those efforts on the outside or is it the efforts on the inside? Is it reducing my addiction to negative stress management tools like nicotine, caffeine, alcohol? refined sugar, recreational drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, food colorings and preservatives? Is it reducing my addiction to those substances? Could it really be that simple? And the answer is yes, right? If you literally reduced uh, our nation's addiction to what we would term as daily acceptable drugs by 10%, we would reduce the amount of mass shootings by 10%. And interesting too, there's a lot of money to be made on those though. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. You know, our society depends on G and H getting their sugar, you know, budget to where they, their numbers say it should be. Yeah. It's uh, amazing. The number of negative things that we do to ourselves and don't even think about it. Don't even really think about it. Yeah, I I get it because guess what? People are doing what you're saying. They're doing everything they can to feel normal. Right. Like children today, this is my my, my neighbor who lives next door. Um, If I go out of into the hallway any time of the day, you smell marijuana because he has to smoke constantly in order to avoid debilitating states of anxiety. So the second he starts coming off of his marijuana, because marijuana is what's called an anxiogenic, which means it's an anxiety-causing agent. Uh, Why is it an anxiety-causing agent? Because it destroys, it's like lighter fluid to cannabinoid receptors, which are meant to make your brain feel calm, right? So when you destroy those, now your brain feels more anxious. So any time of the day that I go outside, he is puffing away this well, guess what? He's attempting to feel normal. So at first I was annoyed, right? Because I don't like to be around those substances. And, and then I thought, he's highly stressed. What else is he going to do? Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he doesn't do breath work, right? He's probably highly dishonest, which I know that he is. Um, He's got a bunch of stressors financially. He's got all these things going on in the background, and he's doing his best to manage that while being in part of a, a collective society that says, hey, the daily accumulated drugs are okay. Or and so way, for anyone They're just a way to get through, right? Yeah, they're a way to get through. And so but people are leaning on whatever they can to attempt to feel normal. So I have no judgment about it. Yet ultimately, I still have to be in reality. Other people have, look, they have a right to live in fantasy. But I know for sure that if you're using the daily acceptable drugs on a semi-regular basis, you're reducing your health and your wellness, which is directly impacting your access to high-level divine consciousness. And why would you ever 
give up your access to God's light and love at a consistent basis to feel it on a semi-consistent basis. Because when you tune into substances that remove your nervous system out of a state of stillness, it's very difficult to hear the voice of God. It's extremely difficult. Well, why do monks live the lifestyle they live, right? That's been a, yeah, a, that's been they, a roadmap forever, is to yeah, have that cloistered, you know, just centering period of time, that, you know, a place that allows you to get away from distractions um, and focus inward. It's, it's, yeah. you know, there's really no secret to it. It's just, I, I don't know, it's almost like we have, a, again, that element of our... Uh, humanity, the the fellow humans, we have that ridicule it. Um, you know, it's seen as a, um, you know, like kooks. They're kooks. Those guys are kooks. They're going off or, or that, you know, worse yet, they become, um, you know, they're led by a leader that is not uh, um, positive, is, you know, actually doing something, a Jim Jones personality, you know, that uh, offers one thing, but is in completely, you know, it is... A, something else altogether and doesn't, doesn't reveal that until it's too late. Um, let me, let me talk about, um, the top thing I'm, I'm, I'm first, I'm going to run out of time here. Um, I didn't, I should have left four hours open in my schedule to talk with you, uh, Christopher, but maybe we'll figure something out afterwards. But, um, can we go back living with a lifetime of unresolved stress is one of the top things. It's the top thing in the, yeah. the listing I got of topics, um, from uh, uh, Command Your Brand. And it says the signs and physical symptoms of unsolved accumulated stress. I think you've sort of alluded to some of those already, but um, you know what? Anyone that's listening that, you know, is maybe thinking, oh, I'm dealing with stress just fine. I'm really okay. I My dad used to hate the word fine. Because when you would ask people, you know, how are you? And they'd say they're fine. He hated that word because it was so ambiguous and so false. And, you know, I had a pretense about it that just immediately it was a wall. Because fine is, you know, no, well, number one, it's not usually fine. You know, you're, you're ta talking about something that's just a wall up. You know, you're fine. Oh, okay, he's fine. I can move on. Um, when... I have in my own life, people ask me how I'm doing and I, I have a real hard time not saying, well, do you really want to know or is this just a platitude? Because I will tell you, I'm pretty good in, you know, at being in touch with where I am right now, but I don't know that you really want to know that. So and I think that's part of where the unsolved, unresolved stress comes from is we don't have those opportunities to really say, well... I'm struggling with this today, or I, I'm finding that, you know, this has been a pattern for me that I really am working on trying to get past. Um, what, what? I think it's about taking a risk. And the risk is, regardless of whether the person is open to it or not, you make the choice to be emotionally honest. And when someone says they're fine, what they're saying is, I'm effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> Oh, well, why didn't you say so? So, <laughs> uh, so, so again, the, whatever. So, what's yeah. the solution? Is it, I mean, the teaching someone how simple. to be that, you know, to let, to yeah. take that risk. You know, you talked before yeah, about the, having the road. Yeah. And that's a scary road. The, yeah. The solution is simple, right? Um, the only way out of that state is through honesty, right? Now, honesty is different than truth and different than lying, right? Truth is intuitive, right? Um, lying is a person is giving you information to avoid punishment, rejection, humiliation, violence, discomfort, pain, and possibly death. And so they're sharing that with you because they're frightened, okay? When someone's dishonest, what they're doing is it's emotional. Dishonesty lives in the emotional world. In the emotional world, it's all about attachment. It's all about connection. And so when we're dishonest, we're disallowing the people in our environment that we influence to know where we're really at in terms of how we feel they're impacting us. And so most people have been raised or trained to never hurt anyone's feelings. 
And they feel like, well, if I share with them how I'm really feeling about this situation, it's going to hurt their feelings. So what I'll do is I'll be quiet and I'll be silent and I'll deal with it on it on my own. The challenge is this, is that when you make that choice, you become what's called excessively emotionally self-reliant. And then you move into a state of emotional hyperindependence. And in that state, there's no room for you to, to move this old toxic emotion outside of you. And then it starts building pressure. And when you build pressure, you start building heat. And when the person starts building heat, all heat rises, right? So when the heat rises, it's called in Chinese medicine, they call it misting the mind. So now the brain gets excessively hot and the brain's going to look for any substance that it can in order to try to cool itself down. Mm. And so what if, mm. if someone is lacking access to someone like me, what is the prudent action that they can take to create a successful pattern to disrupt? And it's easy. Tell the person you're communicating with, hey, I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to step outside. So I want to come back in and continue this conversation and go outside and sit down and focus on slow, deep breathing for about three minutes. Set your alarm on your phone. Everyone has their phone with them and breathe deep because what happens is the person's triggered. And in this triggered state, they're either going to go into fighting retreating, freezing, or excessive complimenting of the other person, right? They're going to fawn them. So what can we do? We can take a half step back, breathe, and then go back into that conversation with that person or that environment that's making you feel overwhelmed and tell someone that you feel overwhelmed. Because when you admit that you're overwhelmed, And guess what happens? The world around you goes, hey, you're overwhelmed. I'm so sorry you're overwhelmed. How can I help you? Because when you admit that you're overwhelmed, instead of being in the protective mode, you automatically shift into the receptive mode. And when you're receptive, you can receive love. It's the opposite of what we were talking about earlier. The person that says, I'm fine, what they're saying essentially is, I'm locked into this inappropriate stress state. I'm in a protective mode and it's impossible for me to get into the receptive mode. And so you go, look, man, I can tell you're stressed. Why don't we step outside and take a couple deep breaths in the hallway? Because I can see you're overwhelmed, Mike. You willing to do that? I'm willing to do it with you, buddy. Let's go. You step out into the hallway. You take three or four deep breaths. Mike then goes, oh, my God, I feel so much better. Thank you. Now he's in the receptive mode. He can enter back into the environment and he can gain what he wants from that experience. The most important part of this strategy is this. When you go home that night, get a chair, sit in front of the mirror and look deep into your eyes and ask your soul and your body what that experience was really about and what you need to do in order to resolve it. And if you're unwilling to admit to yourself that you're imperfect and that you're full of flaws. Your body is willing to continue to keep you in a very dynamic, consistent, complex stress state. Mm. And that's the very simple solution. Get triggered. Someone can tell you're triggered. They ask you, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? You say, I'm fine. You realize that when I say that, what I'm telling everyone in the world is, I'm effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Now that you know that, you can then go, oh, I can take prudent action. What's the prudent action I can take? I can dismiss myself from this experience, go get centered, come back into the experience after I feel centered, and then admit to someone out loud what you were overwhelmed about. So now you drop into the receptive mode. They then give you confirmation 
that they get it. They relate to where you're at. You suddenly feel now you're part of the community again, as opposed to being this emotional outlier and this problem or this issue. And now when you go home that night, you get to sit down in a chair in front of a mirror and you get to do the most prudent thing. You get to be honest with yourself and ask your soul and ask your body and your personality what that was about and what you need to do as a person in order to solve that. So you no longer have to have that experience again of that overwhelming anxiety or that overwhelming anger or that overwhelming state of self-righteous or that overwhelming state of fear. That would be the prudent action to take. Chris, we have so much more to talk about and I, (laughs) I did not allow enough time for how enriching this was going to be. Um, how enlightening it was going to be. Um, can we, can we find a time again to get back? Yeah, we can find the time. Yeah, definitely. Let's 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 get into this deeper because I, one, I enjoy your presence and I enjoy how passionate you are about helping people. And I enjoy the animation and I feel like you and I having consistent conversations can really bring a high level of consciousness to people and give them and allow them to take appropriate steps that will relieve them from their stress in the moment so they no longer have to carry it into the next day sure. and they can feel free enough to be able to pull someone into their life that can help them dissolve these deep levels of daily and lifetime accumulated stress and be free to feel happiness and joy again. And, and that's have, what's important to me. I have a friend that uh, I talked with a number of times during COVID in a medical a doctor, um, that he would talk about addiction. He's actually formed a, an, um, an opiate task force here in Wisconsin. And he, he talked about addiction being, um, a a process of understanding that the app, the opposite of addiction was not abstinence. The op, the opposite of addiction was connection. And, uh, there, there was a profundity about that, that I thought, you know, people need to realize that we, we are addicted to our stress. I think, you know, there's a stressful state yeah. that we are addicted yeah. to being in and yeah. to get out of that requires connection, connection to ourselves, connection yeah. to something bigger than us, connection to the people around us that, you know, we can be connected to others, you know, push back against it, but, um, we will talk. Folks, my, my guest today has been Christopher Maher, a former Navy SEAL, who you would not think, I don't think, was a Navy SEAL from what he has become. And yet I, I, I do believe that, that being a Navy SEAL was very informative for you and led, was a, a very important or series of steps along the way. Um, Chris and I have just begun to scratch the surface of a very complex and yet very simple onion that is in every other every person's life, the layers of stress that we we function with in our lives and uh, i've already gotten you heard him in the podcast you heard him commit to we're going to get together again uh, hopefully soon and uh, hopefully multiple times to try to unravel this thing called stress and why it has such a grip on so many of us and leads us to a place where uh, we can pull out a gun in a mcdonald's and do awful things and the exponential increase in stress that was caused by that action um, you know, we, we wonder with 167, did you say? I, I had lost track of that number. Yeah, 167 mass shootings in the United States already. Yeah. So and we're recording this in year. April. Um, yeah. And, you know, that that's a phenomenal number, especially when you multiply that across the number of families that have been impacted by those events. Um, and then the amount of political discourse and political strife there is over what to do about this. Um, so we will talk more. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Frame of Reference, Sauk County and Beyond. I'm Raul Labush, and uh, we'll be back. So tune in again. Mm-hmm.